Hello, I'm going to talk about dairy products, which have been kind of intermittently briefly mentioned, but haven't been much of a focus. The other thing that's going to be a little different is my focus is going to be on children. Much, although they've been mentioned throughout, a lot of the focus here has been in heart disease and adults. So we're going to talk about diet and push a little bit of the focus to children. That's kind of been my goal for a while. Disclosures are here. I am uh, rejoining the, um, as an advisor to MilkPep. That's the most relevant one. I was on the DGAC. Milk consumption has, has continues to decline. The percentage of children who drink milk and the number of servings per day, can, as well as the proportions per day of, of fluid milk, continues to decline uh, uh, even unto this time. The majority of calcium consumed by Americans of all age comes from milk and from dairy products, but the, yet the intakes of both calcium and vitamin D, which are significant components of dairy products, especially milk, are somewhat low. Factors affecting dairy consumption, consumption decreases with age. There's a concern about the potential fattening effects of milk among teenagers, which is not true. Um, and there's a substitution effect that's important and that teens who don't drink milk may drink considerably more soda. And remembering that what teens do and young children do may largely be affected by what their parents do. Specifically among children and adolescents, about half of all calcium in the diet comes from milk. A little bit of calcium comes from mixed dishes, and the rest comes from other sources, including fortified foods, such as fortified orange juices. Overall, dairy products account for about 13% of the total energy intake in children. Now, what did the DGIC do, do in regards to milk and dairy products? This year's, the 2015 DGIC did not largely address it or largely make any substantial changes compared to 2010. Um, I think it's safe to say that for, for most people, the decision about milk is largely but not completely driven by calcium. There's other key uh, nutrients, especially for children, that are listed there. I won't read them. Um, the dairy group in the dietary patterns includes a number of different things, including soy milks, but does not include almond milk and rice milk. So what is recommended? Well, the AHA uh, and the American Academy of Pediatrics have for a long period of time, I'm sorry, recommended two servings per day of, 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 of milk uh, or equivalent dairy products, and then three servings to four servings per day for young teenagers. And the reason that that goes down to age nine is that in fact, the increase in bone formation begins at the very earliest time of puberty, not in the middle of puberty. So if you wait till they're 15 or 16, you've waited too long. The recommendations in the United States are not terribly dissimilar to those of most Western countries. I won't read through them. They're similar, very similar to those in Canada and Australia. Uh, different countries around the world use different guidelines. The UK has a somewhat more vague guideline, depending upon exactly where you are. Now, I want to go back to childhood and adolescence a little bit more uh, closely, because when we talk about what the minimum calcium intake is and how bone growth occurs, we have to recognize that there's a fairly narrow band during which most bone is grown in childhood and adolescence. And that band begins about ages 9 to 10 earlier in girls and boys, and mostly ends by age 15 to 16. Uh, in girls and a little bit later in boys. And that band is a massive increase in the amount of calcium that's accreted to the skeleton compared to prepubertal and compared to later on in life. And therefore, much of the guidelines that talk about the use of milk to meet calcium, phosphorus, and vitamin D, among other nutrient intakes, largely rests on, those key, on that key skeletal building time period. So what would happen if we took milk out or milk and dairy products out of the diet? Calcium intakes in children would markedly drop. Vitamin D intakes would drop. Potassium intakes would drop. And I want to spend a moment talking about magnesium, which hasn't come up in this conference. And maybe one of the few things that Dr. Willett and I agree on is that our diet is short on magnesium. It's considerably short. When we look at the effectors, which I didn't show here, on bone growth and healthy bone growth, magnesium is every bit as important as, as calcium is. And therefore, we have to consider when we look at different diets making sure that they have enough magnesium in them. The DJC comments were fairly similar related to that, and again, it recommended um, uh, the 2015 
DJC comments really didn't change anything from the 2010 guidelines and what we've already talked about. Now, let's talk about alternate sources. Um, we need our calcium, we need calcium to be bioavailable. There's been a large series of studies that have asked the question, how bioavailable is calcium from other sources other than milk and dairy products? The answer is complicated. For the most part, excepting spinach, the bioavailability of calcium from plant sources is comparable or slightly better than that of milk. I wouldn't hang your hat on getting all your calcium from broccoli because it's super bioavailable because these studies have significant limitations. What's important, however, is that in order to get the amount of absorbed calcium equal to that of a glass of milk or a dairy product, you have to take in a lot of those vegetables. And, and therefore, one has to take a look at, at, at that growing child or that young adult or the teenager and decide whether or not you think that that's practical. This table doesn't have soy milks and almond milks in there. Again, the data on these are mixed. They're highly fortified in many cases with calcium and fortified at the same level as milk, the vitamin D. In some cases, they're less bioavailable. In some cases, they're comparably bioavailable. It depends upon the source. I don't want you to think they've forgotten bugs. Uh, those, those who wish an alternative source of calcium are more than welcome to, to chew on some dung beetles. Um, and, and this really is a book that's out there. So give you a minute to think about that. Now, 10 seconds. The evidence supports an average need of 800 to 1,200 to 1,300 milligrams per day during the peak time period of adolescence I showed you for calcium. The intakes of 1,200 to 1,400 provide a safety margin, most important during limited time period. There is possibility for catch-up, and it's certainly true that depending upon the overall diet, some kids will do okay well below 800 milligrams per day. Intakes in the United States are low. However, the reality is that there's some adaptation. The intakes are 10, 20, 30 percent below the RDA, and I'm not sure that we really face a calcium crisis, as was proposed many years ago. Now, it's not true, on the other hand, that as you go down to extremely low calcium intakes, you still absorb the same amount into the bones. And I, again, I was, I'm not providing a detailed review of the literature here. In the single study that we did, when we took calcium intake down to 400 milligrams per day compared to 1,200 milligrams per day, the bottom line, the amount retained was about a third as much. Um, that, that's because even though calcium absorption was increased and urinary calcium was decreased, the adaptation was nowhere near complete. Uh, there isn't any way you can adapt, especially in adolescence when the natural calcium absorption is 40 percent, to going down to a third of the same amount of calcium. And there's a lot of other data about this in all sorts of different ages, races, boys versus girls, et cetera, that, that I won't uh, provide here, but fundamentally suggests the same type of pattern. I want to talk briefly, mention vitamin D in children. Dairy provides a modest amount of vitamin D. The question is whether or not children that doesn't matter because, after all, children need much higher doses of vitamin D. There's a Cochrane review that fundamentally says the high-dose calcium supplementation in children is not necessary. Uh, the author's conclusions are read there. Or you can read there, basically say that supplementation of deficient children may be clinically useful, but it's not routinely useful. This brings us back to food as well as sunshine and the like as sources of, of vitamin D. A note that deficient was reviewed was defined as something that needs side dose supplementation as being very deficient, that is less than 14 nanograms per ml. And that the RDA, which one can come close to with food, will bring most children up to an adequate level. So to summarize, adequate bone health factors have to be considered in toto. That includes vegetables, fruit, milk, dairy products, yogurts, fortified juices, but we also have to consider the prevailing importance of genetics magnesium, low salt intake, and exercise as an overall picture in determining bone health in children. So to conclude, DJC 2015 reaffirmed dairy products as healthy nutrient sources for Americans. Dairy products uh, provide key nutrients, most critically calcium. Alternative non-dairy type of milk substitutes exist. Some may provide a good nutrient pro profile, some do not. Uh, the modest levels of vitamin D in dairy as well as fortified juices and the like are important. There's no evidence for the routine use of high-dose supplements. 
Therefore, our recommendation is that dairy remain a part of a healthy diet for those who choose to include dairy, recognizing that dairy is currently a critical source of nutrients for most children and adolescents in the United States. If dairy is omitted, which can be consistent with a healthy diet, there's no question about it, one does need careful attention to sources of critical nutrients in a diet, especially in children and adolescents. Thank you.